You're listening to a download from the outdoorstation.co.uk. Number four, two, one. Hello and welcome back once again to the Outdoor Station. I sit recording this in a quiet office, as everyone else in the business centre is enjoying the last day of shopping, as it is of course Friday the 23rd of December. Yes, as I say, take care out there. Christmas is always a bit of a deadline to get things done and obviously make changes. And part of my change will be moving my studio and offices home next week to start podcasting from the salubrious locations of a garden shed. Yes, how the mighty have fallen. However, it is a shed with a view, so hopefully I'll be getting more videos done on gear, on people, on tips and on trips if it all comes together. Now, last week, I shared the podcasting love by introducing listeners to the Mountain Podcast and the Travel Stories Podcast, asking for feedback if any of you had time. And I had a lovely note in from Jason Shoup in the US. Good evening, Bob. I wanted to drop you a line to thank you for turning us on to great podcasts, in particular, American to the British-based podcasts. In your last podcast, you talked about America being good at creating podcasts, but the disclaimer should be there is a glut of shows that really are not up to snuff. I search for outdoor podcasts a lot, and what makes it to the top of the rankings is seldom worth the time to listen. I might not have found uh, Mountain and Travel Stories without your help. I've subscribed to them and have been enjoying their back catalogues all day. That's how better podcasts get recognised by more people, not to mention how much I'm personally enjoying them. Thanks for your efforts, and as always, I enjoy every Outdoor Station episode. Your TGO podcasts are still what I listen to every time I hike for fitness. They are inspiring. Keep it up, sir, Jason. Well, thank you very much for that, Jason. And yes, I hope to be doing a few more podcasts actually during hikes next year as well, part of my cunning plan. So uh, appreciate the feedback. Thanks for taking the time. And that's really great. I've also had some great suggestions from our ever-growing Outdoor Station tribe. Yeah, tribe. I'm not too sure about that. People that join the newsletter. Is it cool to be called tribe? Is it? Are we a bit old to be a tribe? Anyway, that's by the way. Uh, so people joining the newsletter. And I've heard from Joshua Denton, Jose Pereira, Noel Adams, Dave Ramsey, Nicholas Bates, John Dunbavin, Rich Sheward and Mark Tickner. Some lovely comments from them and some great suggestions about who to chat with in 2017, as well as great places to visit and campsites. So there's more of that coming too. There's also been a good number of people entering our competition, so that's growing as well, to win all that hammock camping gear. And that's obviously later on in the show. And talking of which, the interview this week is with Alex Roddy. Now, if you're avid readers of TGO or Trail Magazine, you may recognise his name. If not, I'm sure he won't mind me saying he's probably relatively new to the writing scene, but he has made the interesting transition from writing historical mountaineering books of fiction to very enjoyable feature pieces in magazines and the like. Don't forget, of course, all the direct links to everything we discuss on this podcast and on part two next week can be found over on the appropriate page on the Outdoor Station. And we do touch on many aspects of outdoor interest. Uh, well, I'm, uh, I'm Alex Roddy. I'm a writer and editor, and I mainly write about the great outdoors um, a few years ago, I was mainly writing um, fiction, um, so I've, I've written uh, a couple of novels uh, uh, around the great outdoors, but nowadays it's mainly non-fiction, so you might read my articles in TGO mainly, or perhaps Trail UK Hill Walking, and I also write online as well. Well, looking at your uh, writing history, uh, I notice that you describe yourself as working behind the bar in 2010. Yes. And then your first uh, work came out, I think, in 2012? 
Yeah, that's right. Um, I, I published uh, The Only Genuine Jones, my first novel in 2012. Um, and I'd been working on that for, for many, many years, actually. And we kind of long gaps, not doing anything on it. And then uh, when I left Scotland, I decided I was going to crack on and get it done. <laughs> How did you get to that bar in Glencoe for a start? What, what, what's, what brought you, what took you to that place? Well, I, um, I've been hill walking and kind of into the outdoors since childhood, really. But I didn't really seriously get into it until about uh, 2004, 2005, just before I went to university. And uh, that was the UEA Norwich. And I got, I got heavily involved in the UEA Fell Club. And we used to go up to Scotland every year in the summer. And in my final year, we went to uh, Glencoe and... Uh, Glencoe made a huge impression on me. We stayed at the the little hut beneath Bukeletive Moor, um, Lagengarve, I think it's called, and we we went up a variety of the local mountains. We did the Grey Corries Ridge. We went up Ledger on Ben Nevis, and we went into the Clack Egg Inn um, every night. And I thought it was great. Um, when I graduated, uh, I studied computing science, um, but. I, I knew I didn't want to be a programmer. It wasn't for me. When I graduated, I was kind of a, at a loose end for a while um, uh, until I heard that a friend of mine had just applied for a job as a, uh, a bar person at the Clack Egg. And she said, you know, you should, you should come and do it. And it didn't take me long to realize, yeah, that would be fantastic. So I applied. And before I knew it, I was on a bus with everything I owned in two bags and um, started working behind the bar at the Clack Egg. <laughs> and that in itself must have been quite interesting, watching the people that came through the in the bar sort of social scene. Oh, it was, it was fantastic, yeah. I mean, particularly as I, I started in late September 2008, so it was kind of just on the cusp of a new winter season, and it's a really exciting time of year to be in, in one of the kind of the, the UK climbing centres where there's, there's winter mountaineering, uh, particularly Glencoe with, with its long heritage of winter climbing. And you, you, you'd start to see walkers coming in off the hill, you know, after dark perhaps, and, and, and they'd say, oh, there's a, there's a bit of snow up on Bidgin or whatever. And, and gradually as the season progressed, uh, the winter climbing conditions came in and, and there was a real kind of... Um, uh, a, a buzz when you know with all the climbers coming into the bar and the hill walk as you'd learn about the conditions and uh, I guess it's um it's kind of so, almost like a, a social network without the internet part you know it's a kind of a more human social network um I there's very much still that um human transmission of of uh information about conditions and stuff in in places like the clack egg and amongst all that, was there any kind of social hierarchy between the the uh, climbers and the walkers and general outdoors people? I, I guess there was. I mean, I think a lot of a lot of the uh, the, the people who visited the Clackig, you know, the, the walkers and climbers active in Glencoe, they didn't really see themselves as as superior to anyone else, but. Um, occasionally you would come, you would have people come come in. Maybe they'd done something particularly impressive, and you know, people were overawed by it. You know, we had people coming in having done first ascents and, you know, people would buy them drinks and we had a, a few climbing legends coming in. I, I met Dave McLeod and Alan Hinks and so on a few, a few times after they, you know, come back and from climbing something difficult on Stop Crown Unlock. And it was always a, it was always impressive listening to their tales. Did any of this information sort of work its way into into your first book? I mean, I think perhaps it probably it would be best if you could just give an over a bit of an overview of what the your first book with the only, the only genuine Jones was about. So because I want to to ask you a few questions about that. Yeah, sure. Um, essentially, it's uh, it's set in eighteen nineties, and the central character is a man called Owen Glyn Jones, who was a pioneer and climber active at that time, and. Um, Although there's not much evidence that he did much in Scotland, he was very much involved with the climbing scene in the 1890s, which was very, very small. And there are accounts of some of his friends and people he climbed with doing a lot of the early climbing in Glencoe. For example, uh, J.N. Colley, uh, the Abraham brothers who were active in North Wales at that time, they they went up and did some climbing in Glencoe. Uh, and there is very much that sense of history in the clack egg. I mean, there's a there's a corridor where you can walk down full of old photographs from the 19th century and um, pictures uh, of, of the crags from that era. 
Uh, and there's just this pal palpable sense of history, particularly if you thumb through uh, one of the guidebooks to the area, you, 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 you read about the first ascents and you'll find out who did them. And I, I really came to enjoy that. Um, and it was a real inspiration for that book. So the, the, the book is, um, is essentially my version of, uh, of, of, of how I think may, uh, things may have developed under slightly different circumstances. Um, so in reality, in the 1890s, climbing was, was very, very primitive. Um, if, if you were lucky, you had um, a rope. It may have been 100 feet long. It may have been shorter. You know, you had nailed boots, and that's pretty much all you had. Um, but I imagined what might have happened if a few key characters had met um, at certain points, such as Alistair Crowley, who was, um, he didn't climb very much after the early 20th century, but he was quite active when he was younger in the 1890s. And also Oscar Eckenstein, who invented the first modern crampons. And if you throw all these people into the mix, I thought, well, maybe they'll develop something new. And I had them going up to Scotland, doing relatively difficult ice routes, that kind of thing. It was all it was all kind of fun. And I let my imagination run wild while I was up in the Clackagh and thinking about what they might have done on those mountains. Well, I know the book um, The Only Genuine Jones was very well received and uh, a lot of people have, have written how much they enjoyed it. But one particular part of it which sort of uh, appealed to me was the fact that you actually researched part of it by obtaining or making sort of the older equipment you've described, the sort of jacket and hobnail boots and so on. How, how did that come about? Did you actually find some? Well, it was um, it was a gradual process, really, Um I'd been reading an awful lot of, um, of books from the period, um, and they, they do go into quite a lot of detail about the climbing equipment and techniques of the era. And I thought, well, it'll be fun to actually give it a go, you know, to try it out. Um, and my the first item I found was a very old tweed jacket, which I found at a charity shop. And it's one of the old fashioned ones. It's quite thick tweed. So it's ideal for hill use with a lot of buttons down the front. And... The other items that I sourced, um, I, I, I actually made some of my own boots. Well, I didn't make the boots themselves. I got some traditional leather hill boots with leather soles, and then I attached some Tricuni nails to the, to the sole to make them into climbing boots. Um, and I found the Tricuni nails on eBay after about a six-month search, as I recall, and then I, I got a cobbler's last and a hammer and hammered them in. And um, and finally, the ice axe itself, which was uh, another DIY effort. I got an old, um, I think it was a 1920s Stubby Aschenbrenner, again, off eBay, but the shaft was rotten. So I got rid of the shaft and made my own um, ice axe shaft out of hickory. And um, and yeah, and then I, I climbed with them, basically. OK. And did you sort of go the whole hog and, and find some sort of silk uh, base layers or anything like that? I, I must admit, I didn't get any silk base layers. There, there were a few things that were still modern in my setup. So base layers was one of them. I, I had um, modern synthetic base layers. Um, the trousers that I mostly wore were modern, the thick kind of soft shell ones. Um, again, because I simply couldn't find authentic trousers. Um, but everything else was pretty much as authentic as I could as, as I could go. I mean, I had you know wool and Dachstein mitts that were essentially pretty much the same to what they would have used, if not exactly the same model. I had a woolen scarf, and um, it was a little First World War army knapsack. So n not necessarily everything from the exact correct decade, but it's all in the right spirit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I'm just sort of curious, purely that obviously you use modern equipment uh, mm. in your everyday hiking. Yeah. Did they disappoint or quite surprise you in the way that the actual combination of materials worked? It was a real mixed bag. Um, at first, the, the first outing, I was I was quite surprised at a few things. So, I mean, the the the, the very first set of boots that I had um, actually were were just plain hobnailed boots that I got pre hobnailed, and they were not very secure. So, on hard snow, on on ice, that kind of thing, that you, you skate around in them, they were dangerous. So that's what led me to to try and get you know, Traconi nailed, um, boots that, that were far more, uh, uh, aggressive on ice. Um, as for the tweed that works really well, so long as the temperature is below freezing. So at the moment you get rained on or, 
you know, it gets a bit too warm. It just becomes a bit miserable. You end up like a sort of wet dog, you know. Um, and the ice axe is fantastic. I, I genuinely enjoy climbing with that, um, especially on steeper snow. So most of the routes that I climbed with that setup when I lived in Glencoe were kind of grade one or two winter climbing routes um, in good condition. I wouldn't go on them with that um, setup in poor conditions. And there's something about the act of cutting steps with a long axe on steep snow. It's, it's, it's quite kind of, um, I guess it's more artistic than climbing with crampons. When, when climbing with crampons, you just kind of blast your way up. Whereas when you're cutting steps, you, you have to really think about how you're creating the climb. And it's a, it's a totally different mindset. I really enjoyed that. So has it impacted at all on your modern day climbing, should we say, your, your normal, well, 21st century climbing? I think it has. Um, it, 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 in that period uh, when I was mostly doing that kind of climbing, kind of 2010, 2011, I pretty much stopped the more advanced climbing that I was doing. So, I mean, it, none of it was high grade stuff, but, you know, I was, I was kind of regularly climbing grade three and four winter routes um, in, in Scotland and, um, and kind of up to VS in, in, in the summer. And w when I was doing my, uh, what you might call vintage mountaineering, it kind of made me realize that that's what I enjoyed more. And I pretty much stopped doing more advanced climbing at that time. So kind of slowing down, doing a lot of low grade winter soloing, it led me to realize that that's the kind of stuff that I enjoy I don't really enjoy pushing my grade. I enjoy taking my time, and it's more about kind of the overall experience for me. Right. The The other books, I mean, you've, you've got um, uh, four books in your library, as it were, that you've written, um, mm. three of which are sort of historical mountaineering books, Crowley's yeah. Rival and The Athol Experience, which are obviously great Christmas books for people if they're looking for something to read Eat. over Christmas. <laughs> the one that surprised me um, just looking at your, your CV was The No Way Home, a sci-fi anthology. Yes, that's right. Is that another area of sort of escapism that you, you, you often delve into? Oh, I've, I've always loved science fiction. Um, I've, I've been a science fiction reader since childhood and um, No Way Home and, and the subsequent uh, anthology Crime and Punishment, uh, they were collaborations with a number of other writers. And uh, it was it was the sci-fi author Lucas Bale who brought us all together. Um, he's really good at at, um, at at arranging teams who who all work towards a common goal. And we, we worked on those, I think it was... Um, 2014 2015 we worked on those anthologies and they were really good fun quite hard work very different from my normal material but really good fun oh so it's a, it's a collaboration then it's not oh, all, yes. all yeah, your they're, work they're, they're, they're anthologies i i just had one store in each one of i did i did edit the two uh, books as well Every month, we're holding a special competition where you can win some fabulous outdoor gear. It's a great way to support the outdoor station. The more entries we get, the better the future prize is. During the month of December, the prize is a complete hammock camping setup by DD Hammocks. And this includes a Multicam Frontier Hammock, a Multicam 3x3 tarp, the tarp DVD, 30 metres of Multicam cord, and to finish off your hammock camping look, a DD sweatshirt, a DD t-shirt, and a DD cap to a total combined value of £158. Simply answer the following question and text in your A, B or C answer before the closing date of the 31st of December and you will be automatically entered. You can enter a maximum of five times from the same UK registered mobile phone number. So this month's question is, the mountain Ben Nevis is located in which country? Is it A, Scotland, B, England or C, Wales? To be in with a chance of winning, all you have to do is text OUTDOORS and your answer of A, B or C to 82055. Or post your answer with your name and contact phone number to competition, the outdoors station, unit 19 Signet Business Centre, Hanley Swan, Worcester, WR80EA. Entries are open to anyone aged 16 plus and you must have the bill payer's permission. Texts cost £1 plus your standard network rate and the competition closes at the end of each month. Entries received after that date will not count but you may still be charged. The winner will be contacted within three days of the competition closing and they may appear in future programmes. For full rules plus terms and conditions, please go to theoutdoorstation.co.uk slash competitions.
We've got a picture of you being obviously a, a mountaineering enthusiast and certainly mm -hmm. a, a winter mountaineering enthusiast. Yeah. Um, but slowly over the recent years, I suppose over the last, what, um, as little as three, four years, you yeah. seem to have transferred your skills or your interests or, or your career perhaps has led you slightly down a different path away from sort of mountaineering in its true form, more towards hiking and backpacking. Yeah, that's right. Um and it, it was mainly after I left Glencoe. So, so what happened was um, in around about 2009, 2010, I'd been enjoying climbing in Glencoe. I'd, I'd been loving my time there. Um, but um, I met a young lady called Hannah who lives in Lincolnshire. And we, we started going out. And it was a long distance relationship, of course. I was having to make long train journeys down you know, every couple of months. And I started to wonder if I wanted to stay in Scotland or not, um, or if I, if, if I wanted to be elsewhere. And in 2011, I decided that it was, it was time to move away from Scotland. I think I was starting to take it for granted a bit too much, um, actually living amongst the mountains, um, partly because I don't drive. So I was climbing the same hills over and over again, or I was making long and awkward bus journeys to go to more distant hills. And it, it wasn't quite as, it wasn't quite working out as well as it had been when I first moved there. So I moved away from Glencoe, I moved to Lincolnshire. And since then, I've been doing uh, less frequent, but longer trips. And I've gradually kind of naturally turned back towards a backpacker, which I guess I'd, I'd always been interested in, but I'd never really taken that seriously before. You know, I'd done a few shorter trips, but, you know, with massive packs, you know, weighing a ton. Uh, but since really since 2011, 2012, I've, I've really, really got into backpacking. And, and that's kind of really taken off over the last two or three years, as, as you say. So the transition or the additional work that you've been doing, you've been writing for Trail Magazine and mm. TGO Magazine and no doubt several others, has that come about since the books or did, was that sort of happening at the same time? I'm just trying to visualise how you sort of got into writing articles. Yeah, it, it's it's mainly been after writing the books, but, but it has been going on in the background for quite a while. Um, in fact, one of my first published pieces of work was um, uh, uh, an article for UK Hillwalking for, in 2008. Um, I believe you can still read it online. It's a review for, um, I think it was the Steri Pen Adventurer water filter um, that I took with me backpacking in the Highlands. And since 2008, I've been doing a few pieces on and off for UK hill walking, you know, book reviews, that kind of thing. And then in 2000 and I think it was 2011, I went for a job interview at Trail Magazine um, because I was looking for a job in Lincolnshire and they were based in Peterborough. I think they still are based in Peterborough. So I went for this um, interview uh, for a staff writer position at Trail and I met Simon Ingram, the editor. Um, it was a very, very interesting experience. I learned an awful lot about uh, how trail operates. Um, uh, and, and I went back for a second interview. I didn't ultimately get the job, mainly because I didn't have enough journalism experience, you know, which is fair enough. Um, but since then, I have been thinking an awful lot about, you know, how much I, I enjoyed the experience, how much I'd learned about it. And I started gradually doing more pieces for UK Hillwalking, until uh, last year when I hiked the Kate Rath Trail and Emily Rodway, the editor of TGO, got in touch and said, you know, would you fancy writing a feature for us about the Kate Rath Trail? And it kind of took off after that, really. I, I've been writing regularly for TGO ever since. Um, got in touch with Simon Ingram and said, I've, I've got a route for you for a, for a trail article. You know, do you want me to write something for you on that? And he said yes. And uh, it's it's actually become you know a, a quite a major portion of my job now. Well, that's that's good to hear because I mean the, the 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 creative world is is scattered with with holes of of interest you can fall into and not make a living. Yes, absolutely. And so it's it's good that you know you're actually having editors speak to you and and it's obviously keeping you in in well fresh boots i guess yeah, yeah. um <laughs> one of the articles that i read in particular and the, and the reason i actually got in contact with you was the sky trail i really enjoyed the sky trail and rose wants particularly wants to go and do the sky trail if we can mm. next year and, and it was it was a lovely piece because it's it's not the longest trail in the world and it's not the mm. most complicated or the or the hardest but it's certainly or you made it sound certainly one of the most interesting and possibly uh, one of the most romantic trails mm, certainly is 
yeah, I, I'm, I, we really enjoyed the Sky Trail. I'm, I hiked it with my brother James, um, who is also uh, an outdoor writer, though he's mainly a photographer. Uh, we did it uh, in May 2016. And um, the thing that really attracted us to the, to the Sky Trail was reading about, um, reading various accounts of it. I, I believe it was Cameron McNeish who first um, conceived the idea of the trail. And I've, I've long admired his writing um, in TGO and elsewhere. And when you look at the map, it's, it's just a really great route. I mean, it appeals to me because it's not, it's not necessarily linear. So there's other routes like the Pennine Way, like the Cape Wrath Trail, it's very much an A to B route. But the Sky Trail, it's more about kind of wandering all over the place. I mean, the, the route of the trail goes back and forth around the island, just visiting as many interesting places as possible. And, and yeah, that, that just really appealed to us. Um, and you can vary the route. There's no, there's no one defined route. You know, the, we, we followed um, the route on the Harvey map that's now available at the trail. And, and there's a number of different uh, variants that you can take depending on, you know, your whim, basically. I've also done the, the Cape Wrath Trail uh, mm. and Rose has done the West Highland Way. Yeah. How would you compare those? I mean, the Cape Wrath Trail, I think, I think we both agree, is probably one of the more remote and, and possibly one of the toughest um, yeah. trails as such, uh, particularly the last, last section of it. Yeah. The West Highland Way is, is very much, um, it's almost the first on the list of many people's trails, I think. But you also mentioned you've done the Alder Trail. I've not heard of that one. Yeah, that's um, well. It, it's it's a name that I I basically invented. Uh, this this is the this is the one that I hiked for um, TG uh, sorry for Trail Magazine uh, this year, um, and I, I uh, you know Simon Ingram and I we we talked about it, and the idea was to create um, an alternative for the East Highland Way. So the the East Highland Way is a long distance trail between uh, Fort William and Aviemore. Um, but it's quite an easy one. It, it sticks to the glens. It's it's generally regarded as easier and a bit less exciting than, than the West Highland Way. So the idea was look at the map, come up with a, a worthwhile alternative to the East Highland Way. And that's pretty much what I did. It's it's not anything new. I'm, I'm pretty sure loads of people have hiked it before and just never given a name to it. You know, it's, it's kind of prime TGO challenge territory, really, passing through the, the older area and, and the Cairngorms. Um, and, and I did that this year. I don't know if you listened to the interview I did with Chris Townsend a few weeks back. Mm, I did. Um, but one of the, the things that I find interesting to, to find out about, and I know a lot of people enjoy um, understanding more, is that when you're, you're looking now at your hiking and backpacking experiences, which you know come under the umbrella of work, mm. what's the discipline that you put yourself through when it comes to making notes and recording images and and uh, sort of writing it well presumably as you go along in some form or other yeah that's right i mean i think in some ways my approach is quite similar to chris's so chris explained how he is still more comfortable writing in a notebook uh, and i'm i'm more or less the same um i've experimented with taking digital notes on my smartphone but I normally come back to keeping notes by hand. And what I do is I, I keep a small pocket notebook and I, I occasionally I'll write in it during the day. But again, like Chris, I, I often use my camera as, as, as a notebook to record uh, interesting things just to jog my memory later on. And then in the evening, as often as my, as my dinner's cooking, I'll, I'll sit down and I'll write up the day in as much detail as I can because I've got a terrible memory. Um, and another um, important part of my routine is that I, I don't actually um, record tracks um, on GPS as I, as I go, but every evening I will uh, create a route on ViewRanger on my phone showing exactly where I've been for future reference. Because quite often, although I'll create, you know, I'll plan a route in, in the digital navigation app view ranger before I go, I might not always follow the same route on the day. So I, it's always important for me to know exactly where I've been. So I know how far I've walked every day, what the total ascent is and so on. Um, and of course, um, I also take a lot of photos. Um, this is something that's really changed for me over the last couple of years I never really used to take photography very seriously. I'd just carry rubbish little compact cameras and I used to get through quite a few of them. So I think when I was living in Glencoe, I think I got through about four or five cheap compact digital cameras in the few years I was there because they kept breaking. I kept leaving them on buses, you know, that kind of thing. And last year 
um, I decided to really make an effort to improve my photography um, because I realized if I'm going to be writing articles uh, for magazines, they, they need top quality photography. And I kind of made a mistake on the Cape Wrath Trail. I, dis- I looked at my gear list. I was trying to lighten the load. I thought I'll take a compact digital camera with me, just a cheap one, just because it's lighter. And my photography was not as good as it could have been. So since then, I've, I've upped my game. I've got a much better camera set up now. And that's a really important part of recording it and, and, and making sure I've got enough material for the feature that I'm writing. And um, it's not only landscapes, you have to take pictures, you know, action shots as well. So pictures of myself walking, you have to set them up with a tripod if, if you're not walking with anyone else. Um, pictures of your shelter at night, um, action shots of you cooking, unpacking, that kind of thing. So there's quite a lot involved, really. Yeah, so all these sort of activities take time. So do you find do you find your days are longer as a result? They can be, um, and sometimes it can be a bit tempting just in the evening, if particularly if you're tired, just to think, oh, I'll I'll leave it till tomorrow. But but the problem is, it it can kind of pile up if you do that. And on a recent trip to the Cairngorms, I I'd I'd been um, wading through deep snow, and I arrived at Coral Bothy absolutely knackered, uh, probably about nine o'clock at night. And I pretty much just got into the bothy, dumped everything on the floor and went to sleep. And then the next morning, I then woke up and forced myself to write everything down about the previous day and, you know, plan, plot my GP, um, GPX route on them. Um, on view ranger and, and everything so it, it it can have an impact actually <laughs> yeah well I, I was just equating the thoughts of what it must be like to to have done a long day yeah. uh, depending on what the train was like just generally a long day and then finding the enthusiasm to to focus and and jot down detail i mean rose when i'm with rose she's very good she's always kept a diary so she tends to write her own shorthand and and then when we look back and over the time she can remember the detail which is often forgotten as a bit of a blur to me. But it's the same as when, you know, when we're traveling and I'm doing videos or podcasting, it, 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 you know, you have to have the discipline to to sit there and, and painfully sometimes go through it, which is a shame, really, because a lot of the times the, it, the pleasure is the solitude and the actual camping and just staring at the stove while it's the food's coming to the boil. Oh, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. Which leads me on to something that you've written in the past, actually, which was an article uh, in 2015. Ditching the Infinity Machine. Ah, yes. <laughs> and uh, that that was an, a fascinating read. And I think I'm sure our listeners would love to hear the story about that. So would you mind running through that for us? Sure. Um, well, I think it's it really started in, I think it was 2012 or 2013. I'd been, I'd been using my smartphone in the mountains, as, as many of us do now. And I... I started to just develop this vague feeling that it was it was distracting something from my enjoyment of the outdoors. I mean, at that time, I wasn't I wasn't writing articles for magazines. Really, it was I was just writing notes for my own blog, my own enjoyment. And I had been staying at Glen Shiel for a week. I think this was on the 2013 trip. And I'd been trying to send a blog post or up- upload some photos or something and, and the signal was poor and then my battery drained and, and I kind of, I got, I got frustrated with the whole thing and I started to wonder if my use of digital navigation and my use of a smartphone in the hills in general was just taking something away from the experience. And I was also approaching a time in my life where I was, I was, I was changing jobs. I, I, I used to work at Carphone Warehouse after leaving um, Glen Coe, my, my, my day job was a, um, a phone salesman at Carphone Warehouse. So that was quite a kind of techie job. And I had to keep up with the latest trends and the latest technology. But when I left that job in 2014, I, I thought, well, I, I, I've never really been that interested in the latest tech, etc. And, and maybe it's time I just took a break from, from that kind of stuff. So I thought, right, I'll just, I'll stop taking my smartphone to the hills. I'll just get a basic phone, stick a basic SIM in it and, and see where that takes me. And it was quite an interesting experience. I mean, an awful lot of people obviously still don't have smartphones. An awful lot of people still just take a basic phone in the hills and they're completely happy with it. Just just um, to stop you there, could you just make sure you mention which phone it is you take so that I know there's a lot of people still using them. Oh, right, yeah. Well, it was a Nokia. It was a, th- uh, I think it was a 30, no, a 6410 or something like that. But it was one of the really basic ones. <laughs> and... A, br- a brick, with- I seem to remember, is the technical brick. term, yeah. It was a brick, yes. And I took it with me um, on a trip to Scotland in late 2014, and it was all a bit of a disaster, really. Um, 
mainly due to my own ineptitude. I'm, I'm quite bad with public transport. And um, basically the, the, the battery in the thing died um, very, very quickly. I mean, I have, I have memories of the, the batteries in these things lasting a long time, but particularly when it's an old device and the battery is going to be old, they, they, they don't in practice. And I tried plugging it into my little portable power brick to charge it up, but the voltage was wrong or something and it wouldn't charge. Um, I had to cut the trip short because the weather was abysmal and rain was washing away paths and whatnot. And on the way back, I, I encountered a massive public transport cock up. Um, and this started with getting stranded in Fort William for a while, then getting stranded in Glasgow for a while. And, this is when I really started to come against the limitations of not having a smartphone. You, you kind of don't think about this when you have one because it's easy to just look up when the next train is or if you need to look up, you know, where a hotel is or something like that. But it had been years since I'd had to do that stuff without a smartphone. So I was basically stranded in Glasgow Central after the last train in the south had, had gone or I'd missed it or, or whatever and thinking right i need to sort myself out i need to find somewhere to stay for the night um so i basically had to end up going around businesses asking where the local hotels were and then finding a, a paper map wandering around the city finding out that they, they were all full due to some event or something in the town so it didn't really end well and i what ended up happening was my partner hannah ended up calling some friends of ours in Glasgow and saying, can you go and rescue Alex, please? <laughs> <laughs> so that's when I realized maybe for me, I mean, for, if you can get by with a brick in the hills, that's great, more power to you. But for me, I realized it was not really that good an idea. So after that, I thought, well, I'll get a slightly more modern Nokia with a 3G connection so that I can access the internet in an emergency. But and it, it did work well for a while, but eventually I just realized the problem isn't with the technology, it's how you use it. And that realization led me to get my act together, I suppose you could say, and just start using a smartphone more sensibly, you know, just rationing the battery power, only need, using it for what you need to use it for. And since then, I've I've not really had any more issues. I think you just have to have a bit of discipline in how you use these things in the hills. Yeah, I suppose the other side of it is it's all a case of, of what you actually get used to having your hand on at any one time at short notice. Yeah. You, you know, you get used to the GPS system and the mapping system on phones, yeah. uh, and it's so easy to let your skills with map and compass start to slip. Uh, and it's the same, obviously, with you know, a good example. It's the urban side of it rather than the mountain yeah. side that actually caused you the problem, wasn't it? It, it was, and, and it was, you know, it was unnecessary, really. I think, I think you know... I. I don't know. It was it was just a bit of a, <laughs> a bit, bit of a, a bit of a mess up in general. And that brings me to the end of part one. My thanks to Alex for taking the time to chat, and I'd like to add a further thanks to all our listeners too for sticking with us, dropping me emails, helping promote the podcast generally across all the various social media networks, etc., etc. It all helps, and I'm seeing the Twitter followers steadily grow these last few months. So keep promoting us if you can, and my thanks again. In part two, we touch on walking in the Alps, Alex's journey to carrying less weight and less gear, and his thoughts on footwear. So, enjoy your holiday break. I hope however you choose to spend your time, you're safe, you're in the company of loved ones, and you enjoy good humour. So, until next time, folks, bye for now. Thank you for listening to this podcast. To hear or see more from our extensive free library, please visit theoutdoorstation.co.uk.